cosa, Patrick. Heidi, director at Animal Kingdom Foundation, a nonprofit animal welfare NGO committed to improving the living and welfare conditions of animals in the country of the Philippines, where they are located, and eliminating the cruel trade of dog meat for human consumption. Our talk today will focus primarily on AKF's investigative work and campaigns to end the very cruel dog meat trade in the Philippines. Animal Kingdom Foundation was founded in 2002 by the late Charles Leslie Wardenberg, driven by his love for animals. It started with Charles learning about the horrors of the cruel dog meat trade in the country and about how common of a practice it is in the provinces. Troubled by this cruel act, he arranged a team that would help save the helpless dogs from slaughter and make the perpetrators liable for this cruelty. Due to its prevalence in the country, numerous raids and interceptions have been conducted in various locations, saving the lives of thousands of dogs. To provide shelter for the rescued dogs who were once bound for slaughter, AKF put up a rescue and rehabilitation center in Kapas Tarlac. 
Here, their medical needs are taken care of and they are rehabilitated until they can be adopted by their forever families. Today, Animal Kingdom Foundation is one of the most respected animal welfare NGOs in the country, working and campaigning not only for the welfare and protection of companion animals like dogs and cats, but also for farm animals. So without further ado, welcome to the show, Ati. <laughs> Hi, hello. How are you, Jade? Um, just please call me Heidi. <laughs> Heidi. Okay. Hi. Your yes. your your sur your surname is Ati, and your first name is Heidi. Mm. No, it's actually well because I'm a lawyer, and here in the Philippines, people would usually call you attorney. So oh. you know, A T T Y is actually that. I so your name is Heidi. Me. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm so glad you corrected me. Thank you. So Heidi is uh, woke up very early this morning to be on the show because we are 12 <laughs> hours apart. Uh, you are in the Philippines. I, of course, am in Canada where I grew up. And so I really appreciate your time today. And I know we're going to our viewers are going to look forward to learning more about the dog meat trade in the Philippines. It's a country that we have not covered yet on the podcast. And so I'm really, really looking forward to our conversation. Uh, but before we get into the gist of our talk today, I always like to learn a little bit more about our guests. So if you wouldn't mind telling us a little bit more about you, uh, I mean, for example, are you a native to the Philippines? Yes, yes, definitely. I'm full-blooded Filipino. I was born and raised here in the Philippines and have been living here since i mean i haven't really been elsewhere except for travels and 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 tours and whatever but i'm a full-blooded filipino and and what part of the philippines did you grow up well i uh, i i grew up here in manila and i'm staying currently still in manila and this is um really where i i also uh, practice my my legal profession and yes. our rescue center is uh, located in another province, but it's just really about uh, an hour away, an hour and a half away from Manila. Okay, so it's not too far. <laughs> um, I'm curious, how did you, because you said you're an attorney by profession. Uh, and so how did you get involved as director of Animal Kingdom Foundation? Well, um, so many years ago, so many years ago, um, Animal Kingdom Foundation was looking for a lawyer and I was referred um, uh, to, to work as a lawyer for the organization because I, I think that at that time we were still organizing um, uh, a, uh, Animal Kingdom Foundation was really very uh, new at that time, sometime I think in 2003. So I started organizing legally. Mm -hmm. um, the foundation, and then I was working on um, different policies, um, and and if they would, um, the Charles would have some concerns or issues in relation to their raids or whatever, yes. he would also always consult me on that, and then later on he would always also involve me on matters relating to operations campaigns and he I, I don't know what he saw in me because I kept you know trying to run away or get away from him that no no that's not my job but <laughs> he keeps on you know trying to 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 tell me in a way that um I, I think he believes that I can do more than right. just you know putting legal perspective on what they do and advising them on some on, on legal aspects. So that you've in, got in more involved that, at that context point. I started. Yes. I was, yeah, I, I got so involved in it. And then I saw some avenues where we can improve animal welfare. So I started suggesting. And since I suggested it, I had to work on it. Of course. So, <laughs> yeah, so, and, so you know, so so that, and that's that, how I, I really got so involved. That, so I guess you've been involved from the beginning and in some respects, you know, they called upon your your legal expertise early on, I imagine. Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. Yes. In a way, but not really from the beginning because they were um, they they started already raiding while they're not really yet organized. Right. Um, it started course, small. Seeing, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And seeing, of course, the, the need for a legal entity to be established then um, yeah. and, and really become operational, then 
that's where I came in. Yes, I can imagine how important it is to have a legal counsel <laughs> when you're trying to, you know, like work with, you know, people that, you know, work outside the law and how to make them accountable. And you need to understand the legal framework, what you're allowed to do and what not. So I, I have no doubt you were invaluable. <laughs> um, so I would uh, ask you, what would you say are the most pressing animal rights issues in the Philippines at the moment? Um, right now, of course, other than the dog meat trade issue, um, I would think that, you know, that culture of neglect mm. among, you know, generally among among uh, pet owners or facility owners and operators, that concept of neglect is so apparent and I, I think really needs to be addressed. Yeah. Um, they would uh, there's there's this lack of um, lack of empathy Care. and rec- yeah and and um, uh, acknowledgement that animals can feel and can suffer. Yes, and I, I correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you do have animal welfare laws in the Philippines. That's correct. Um, in 1998, we passed our Animal Welfare Act or uh, Animal Welfare Law. And I, I think we were, if not first, we were one of the first in Asia to even have an yes. animal welfare law. I believe so you were. Yes, I, I believe you yeah. were. And if I want to be a little bit more specific, uh, they said, you know, because the Philippines was on my list of the first countries to really ban the dog meat trade legally. And I believe it was um, the killing and selling of dogs for food was banned in the capital city of Manila, where you're from, in 1982. A similar ban was enacted nationally in 1998 with the Animal Welfare Act, Republic Act number 8485. And then the act prohibits killing dogs for food with minimum penalties. I mean, it's a thousand pesos, which is like the equivalent of about $22 US at the time. We're talking about 1998 and uh, not less than six months in prison. So that part is a little bit more, uh, you know, you know, uh, uh, severe. Uh, and then there was the Anti-Rabies Act that was passed in 2007. And that included more severe penalties with minimum fines of 5,000 pesos. At that point, it got a little bit increased and not less than one year of imprisonment for trading dogs for meat. So so that's why I was like, oh, my God, but it's still happening. And we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later on. But for now, you're saying that neglect and what would you say is it neglect of companion animals or just strains in the streets like a, a just a general misunderstanding or you know lack of care for animals in general are we talking about more companion animals or farm animals or both <laughs> yeah uh, yes um it, it's um I and mean, when i say neglect it's neglect both for pet um, for pet uh, animals as well as of course farm animals in general. Yeah. Um. I, I guess again it, it boils down to um, the animals not being recognized by or generally recognized by owners or the the general public that they also can feel and can suffer. Yes. But but Jade, can I just go back on the laws that yes. you mentioned on the yes. line back? Please um, correct me. That, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I just want to be um um uh, you're correct. No, we had that Animal Welfare Act in nineteen ninety eight that generally um prohibits all types of cruelty, maltreatment, and neglect for animals. But um, it did not specifically prohibit or ban the dog meat trade. Uh... It did not say specifically that dog meat trade is illegal or something like that. But because the practice, um, of course, um, um, uh, entails the act of, uh, of, of cruelty, then still we can say that it, it's prohibited. Um, yes. But the but but the anti rabies law specifically really mentioned yes. the the prohibition on the dog meat trade 
or the killing of animals for human consumption. And in fact, the law says that the local government units should prohibit it. And and that's yeah. another, I think, that, that's a, a gray area in the law, but it has not really been questioned legally. So it stays there. And we're using that really as a basis for us to 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 um, indict or prosecute um, dog meat traders. Right. So it's more the two, the one that was passed in 2007 and that's the Anti-Rabies Act. And I believe, you know, there's been a lot of talks. Indonesia has, you know, promised many times that they wanted to do the same because uh, what a lot of people don't understand and what I've come to understand through my many interviews with the podcast is that human rabies is a big problem. Um, and, you know, Southeast Asia, Indonesia, you know, all port- parts of Asia. And that is kind of directly correlated to the dog meat trade. I mean, the people in you know, involved in the trade, not so much the consumer of the dog meat once it's cooked, but the the people trading dogs, you know, a dog can have rabies and they can have cuts on their hands and they can become infected and human rabies is fatal. So <laughs> that's a big problem. Um, and so, yes, at least you have that. But as I've also come to highlight on the show is that you can have the best laws in the world, But if they're not enforced, you know, unfortunately, you know, the dog meat trade does continue under the radar, you know, you know, uh, underground, if you will. So um, I will ask you next that um, I guess the core focus of Animal Kingdom Foundation's campaign work today, would you say it's more focused on ending the dog cat meat trade or are there any other areas of focus? Yes, our uh, core program is still the, the end the dog meat trade campaign because um, if we are going to compare the Philippines as against the other Asian countries, I think we have been really very successful in reducing the trade. But as you can see, there's still um, pockets of these activities happening elsewhere. And what we are really doing right now is doing what we call cleansing trying to really um, identify this other areas that are still doing it and yeah. really put a stamp and and hopefully end the dog meat trade eventually. But other than this, of course, we have other programs that we have been doing because um, we believe that, you know, you cannot end cruelty, the, the, the culture of cruelty in general, just, you know, just what, doing one campaign. At this point in time, we have really evolved into different campaigns because we see that the dog meat trade has really been declining um, um, because, of course, of our um, uh, staunch campaign to end it and to, to um, really um, put that stamp of end Yes. In the dog meat trade campaign. That's why we said that while we're doing that, it's also time for us to really look into other animal welfare issues in the country. Of course. But I would I would agree that, you know, unless this trade is eradicated, it's hard to make, you know, progress into other, you know, areas of animal welfare, for example, farm animals. Uh, because, you know, like it or not, we're more and more globalized you know, people have a more and more of an understanding, uh, whether it's influenced from the West, that dogs are companion animals. I mean, they feel this animal sentence. And imagine some of your campaigns do address, you know, the importance of spaying and neutering, uh, you know, animals, companion animals, and that sort of thing. Uh, But do you have any specific educational programs or like, how how does Animal Kingdom Foundation work? Is it more trying to address where the trade happens, the areas where the trade happens, and trying to prosecute those, uh, you know, the, the parties involved? Or is it like, you know, widespread, you have education programs, and, you know, I guess maybe let us know a little bit more how you're, you're engaging that part of the market, you know, in the Philippines. Yeah. Um, because our core program is uh, the ending of the dog meat trade, we have um, we we saw the importance of education 
um, not yeah. just of course the community but also the school children about animal welfare. So we said that in order to end the dog meat trade, we should start community engagement and education. Yes. So be because we cannot just end the dog meat trade by prosecuting, by by raiding, arresting, and all. It's not gonna happen. It it will just you know it, it will just come back one way or another. So yeah. there has to be there has to be a holistic approach yeah. or a holistic program. So we started doing our education program, um, I think 2008 year back, uh, years back, and then you know we started with school children. We were doing education in areas where there's this massive practice of dog meat trading, and in the other area where the main source of the dogs are being taken. So that's where we focused our education program. And then eventually, we spread out these education programs to different villages and, and barangays and where we also included already spay and neuter program. Yeah. Again, this is in relation to the dog meat trade because of the proliferation of you know, stray animals in the street. Yeah. Then we said there is this opportunity for the dog meat traders to, to, there's a source to get the dogs from, either from the streets or from the pet owners. But when you start this pay and neuter program and you help in, in, in controlling the population yeah. of the dogs in the street yeah. and pet owners, you know, taking accountability that when I have, and realizing that I have to spay and neuter my dog because mm. it's, it, I don't want it to grow, to, to grow, I mean, the population to grow. So it, it builds that consciousness of responsibility. So we, we put them all together because, again, this um, spay and neuter vaccinate program and also the education program will impact on the dog meat trade. Of course, um, yes. Um, uh, campaign and in fact we even leveled this up by educating the the the, the, the police officers um, in terms of how um, to expand or better understanding of the animal welfare laws yes their role as the as the police officers in in in, in um, enforcing the law and also even to the extent that we also um uh, capacitate them in investigations in relation to animal welfare. So that's how yeah. we evolved our program because yeah. we believe that it all, you know, impacts the dog meat trade. Yeah, I I love the fact that you're you're taking a holistic approach. I mean, that's the the most the best way to tackle the the issue. Uh, it can't just be like banning you know, and tr going after criminals, uh, you have to sensitize the population, make them understand, you know, animal sentence, how to care for your pets, you know, for those that have pets. Um, and I was like, very, very impressed that, you know, your foundation has partnered up with the Philippine National Police, Bureau of Animal Industry, Animal Welfare Division, and National Meat Inspection Service and the implementation of the laws against animal cruelty, especially against the dog meat trade. So I'm like, you know, my first thought was like, how did you manage to establish these partnerships? And what is their incentive and, in, you know, joining you and working with you? Because I know that you're coming at it from an animal welfare perspective, but what's in it for them, for so to speak? Because a police officer doesn't have the same perspective as you, you know, like, Maybe they like animals, maybe they don't, but what's their incentive in partnering up with you? Yeah. Well, um, first, how did we came about with all this um, arrangements or, or uh, partnerships? Uh, again, you know, looking at the dog meat trade campaign, we said, um, I, I said, you know, we cannot just do raids all the time. And then the, the, the police, you know, it, it's so hard to deal with them and all. And then as a lawyer, of course, I, I looked at the, the law and, you know, the, the law should be enforced by the police. Yeah. The law should be implemented by this government agency. So I put them all together and I said, let's come up with an agreement with the police so that they can, uh, they, they can help us yes. um, implement 
our the law and then they can help us also make our job in 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 ending the dog meat trade and specifically in raiding and arrests and all right. so we came up with that um we we came up with that um agreement and i i think um it it's just basically really um timing and relationship really matters in terms of yeah. working with the government agencies so that went well in in 2007 actually we had we we had our relationship with the police since 2007 and then with the bureau of animal industry it's again um um because of our dog meat trade um program we said that the the bureau of animal industry is a government agency that enforces i mean that implements animal welfare program in the country right and um to be affiliated and to be partnering with them we are also um uh capacitating them in terms of fulfilling that obligation right. and legal law uh, i mean role and in uh, with respect to the national meat inspection service at that time we had difficulty in assessing whether a meat that we were able to recover or retrieve during our raids is dog meat yes, or goat yes. or or yes. you know pig or whatever meat yes and we had always had that you know there's no laboratory there's no The way you know, of ability. testing it really yeah. <laughs> there's really no zero ability for yeah. anywhere here in the country to test that right so we donated we donated actually we we fundraised abroad and then we donated this meat inspection pcr tests it, yeah. it's it's a it's a it's an equipment and then we donated that to the meat inspection service and then we mutually you know studied and and came up with protocols on how to test oh, and all wow. And That's so amazing. you know, and and so whenever we now have um, raids, we have good relations with the police. We have arrangement with the police. We have also this relationship with the Bureau of Animal Industry, and we have the capacity to test the meats that wow. we recover, and that also um, um, intensifies or or strengthens our evidences in prosecuting dog meat traders. So again, wow. it's a holistic, you know, um, approach yeah. that we want to really anchor on, so that we would have a better partners, um, better implementation of the law, and you know, wow. effectively enforce it. That's very good because you know, like you're helping them, and in turn, they're helping you. So you're sharing a lot of your expertise, your insight, what you you've discovered. In the country, and they in turn can help you, you know. So supporting each other, and I, I would like wonder if you have the same kind of corruption that happens in many countries, like Vietnam. We all know that you know police officers are regularly bribed uh, by dog meat traders to you know stay quiet, look the other way. Um, does that happen also in the Philippines? Would you say, or to a lesser degree? It. There, I, I can say that in general, because um, um, there may be, but not as you know as extensive or massive yeah. as that of of the Vietnam, other Asian, yeah, yeah Vietnam China, and other Asian, <laughs> yeah, other Asian countries. But um, well, our struggle really is that some of the police officers would also be. Consumers of dog yes, meat. Yes, yes, that's in so, South Korea yeah. as well. A lot yeah. of people in government they don't want to end the dog meat trade because they consume it themselves. They they believe in it, you know. So yeah, makes so it's it not harder. really much on it's not really much on corruption, um, but really more to that because yeah. you know um, I'm not maybe there's maybe some degree of police protection, mm. but because over the years we have been really partnering with them there's that consciousness maybe that they are also very careful about it yes but it it may happen in some 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 parts but not you know. to the same degree as other no. places okay well that's good <laughs> um <laughs> i i was uh, wondering i mean there's so many things i have to ask you but i'm trying to keep a, a look at the clock as well 
Um, so we've covered that you do have educational programs and all that. Um, oh yeah, so you did mention this, but uh, I was curious, given the fact that you did implement some laws in the Philippines early on before any other Asian, Southeast Asian country, um, would you say there's more of um, an awareness from the general public or is it like, I guess my question is more, what is your main obstacle in sensitizing the population? Is it like uh, a cultural thing in the Philippines to eat dog meat to the same extent that it is in China? I mean, it seems to be more of a thing in China with like history, like a long his dated history of consuming dogs. Uh, would you say the same thing can be said about the Philippines or is it? cultural related like are people saying this is our cultural right to eat dog meat the way they do that in china well in the philippines um as a country is not a dog meat eating country okay there are just specific areas where they are consumed traditionally like maybe um, um, in the northern part of the country, in the Cordilleras, in the mountain provinces. Okay. Um, so that in in that particular sense, yes. And but you know now in the recent times, dog meat eating is also being practiced, but not related to culture or cultural tradition or or whatever religious tradition, but it's really more on the the fact that they are being used as beer mates as what beer mates you know when when you um drink alcoholic drinks and oh you eat, yeah it's, it's like you're going to have Philippines. ribs and you know beer but you're yes. you have dog meat and beer yeah okay <laughs> so that you know the 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 the, the consumption has yeah. evolved to that Okay. So while we can say that that the Philippines is not really um does not really consume dogs as a cultural practice generally. Okay. There are pocket areas in the country that does it. Right. And there's a cultural um um history on it. Mm -hmm. But you know the the how it went and grows eventually over the years has nothing to do with culture or religious tradition. Okay. So would you say it has, you know, like, I guess it doesn't have a long dated history of, you know, dog meat consumption in the Philippines. It's, it's not something that's been happening for thousands of years, would you say? Or no? Yeah, yeah. No, 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 it's not like that. Actually, well, um, the, the history there is just about very recent 19... Um, 1900s or something. Okay. But, yeah. But, you know, it has something to do with a religious ritual where the dogs are being used or offered as a sacrifice. Mm. Um, and, and, you know, the consumption is limited in that uh, tribe that, you know, celebrates or, or practices this uh, ritual. Okay. Um, so it, it's uh, from this, it again, it just, you know, evolved to become a commercial okay. um, yes, yes. aspect. Yes. But from, from but but because but because I think that the Philippines in general is a pet loving country, there's also an outcry locally yeah. to stop that. That's why, you know, it, it's, it's, it's really like, oh, in that area, in the northern part of the country, they're just really, you know, dog meat eaters there. So it's, right. it, 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 it's bad because it has, it has um, um, the, the, the perception is that, oh, the Philippines is, is really a dog meat eating country because of this tradition. But the truth is, it's not. No. There's just really specific areas in the country and it's not really actually even um majority no and so i don't know if you've conducted surveys like you know i don't know uh, your foundation per se or you know other go government agencies would have conducted a survey with the population and 
you know, the survey would reveal that the majority of the population would be against dog meat, I, I'm assuming, from what we you're telling not, me. Yeah, we did not do um, a, a national survey, right. but we did the focus group discussion in 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 one um in 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 this um area i'm referring to the northern part of the country uh, we did a focus group discussion because they're more into it and to see is it really uh, a cultural tradition or is it really um um prolific in in that right. area and and to compare it to what we see what we read and what's happening really so we we found out that most of the younger population the young parents now mm. the, the 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 younger generations are against it themselves yes and they're even embarrassed to be coming to be to be tagged right. as dog meat eaters from that province right because they said that we're not we're, we're dog lovers we're, exactly. we're, we're pet lovers but because that of this stigma that you know that that had been uh, stamped on them, then they carry on that label that they're dog meat eaters, and they right. don't like that. So over the years, um, I, I said that you know if we stop the supply going up to that um, city or province, yeah. then maybe it will stop. That's what we yeah. were doing. We were stopping the supply. Ah. Um, from from that other province where it yeah. supplies from these northern consumers, oh, we wow. were stopping them from elsewhere so yes. that the supply won't go up there. And then you know, it, well, if it's not available, <laughs> it reduce if you the consumption. Hurt the demand. Well, you can definitely uh, attack the supply side. Um, and I would, uh, I know one of my previous guests was mentioning because she's part uh, Philippine. Uh, she's from the Philippines, uh, but, you know, half Filipino. Uh, and she had mentioned, uh, I forgot the, the province, but she said it was Chinese and Korean settlers that in that area that really brought the dog meat trade to the country. But I mean, no. it kind of... No, 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 no. Actually, I, I don't think so because the curry. No, I don't think so. No, but okay. then, but but you have to understand also the in the Philippines right now we have so many Filipino Chinese. We, yes. we have a lot of Chinese citizens that of has course. become Filipinos. Of course, and there the Koreans are also coming in to the country already. There's a lot of Koreans. Um, pre-pandemic, there's so many. You know, um. Um, Korean tourists that has been really staying in the country doing business right. and studying and all and we uh, at that point in time we also realized that there's an increase again in the dog meat consumption mm -hmm. so you know and and um, it, because again it, it for them it's it's legal in their country Yes, so, no, that's right. So they bring a little bit of that mentality and, you know, like, obviously, it's it's going to continue. But um, what, would you say the main source of these dogs are mostly strays or is there a lot of, you know, pet theft in the country as well? Um, uh, yes, it's a combination of one, stray dogs, pet thefts, yes, and number three, pet selling. Pet selling. Are we talking about uh, breeders for the pet industry that end up selling some of these dogs that are not, you know, um, meeting, you know, customer criteria or something? Well, fortunately, it's not like that. I, no? I, 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 when, when that happens, oh, my gosh. <laughs> but fortunately, it's not like that. It, okay. It's more of, you know, pet owners who may have, you know, five, ten dogs in their house. Oh, uh, they, they sell would, uh, for money. Okay. So more for like for poverty Disposing. reason. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and so and they, they cannot just, you know, maybe try to 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 handle. They cannot anymore afford maybe to yeah. handle so many dogs in houses. And so they just sell it. Right. So anyone who goes around and, and look for dogs for sale then they just sell it i mean it's, it's an opportunity to, to earn income 
to earn some extra income. And so on that note, would you say that people involved in the trade are mostly in poverty stricken areas of the Philippines and they're doing it because they don't have any other, you know, kind of career opportunities. They lack education, they lack skills. And so they give in to the, you know, trading dogs for money because of lack of opportunity. Um, early on in the Philippines, I think it's like that. It's like that, you know, the poverty and the lack of other opportunities to earn income. Right. Um, um, you have to understand that when we were starting on the dog meat trade, we were dealing with um, groups, syndicates mm. that, that really do this and masks. Oh. Um, but eventually during um, in, in our um, staunch rescue raids and, and you know, operations to, to to stop these traders we were able to to arrest these major groups we were able to make them stop yeah. trade still happens and then there's a whole new scenario mm. you know it's it's now it's now people who again may be poor and lacks education or people who just really wants to earn income even right. if they really have a regular day job yeah, they on the side they do that yes. for extra income and when you say groups, I guess we're talking more like criminal gangs, you know, like criminal activity, like, you know, <laughs> mafia like fa you know, families. I think that has been well kind of documented at this point in China. There's like big families that control the dog meat trade in the north. And, you know, so it's not like a small scale operation. It's a big it's a pretty well organized one. Uh, so I guess it's similar a little bit in the Philippines. Yes. Yes, it, yeah. it was something like that. Like for example, in this particular province, the the whatever name would pop out as the the one that controls it in this area and in another province, another right. and then here in the north are the financiers. Mm -hmm. So there's some kind of organization or organized yes. activity in wow. in the trade itself. Yes. Yes. All right. Well, um, I'm still very impressed that you are the one who kind of made it possible to test what kind of meat it would be. Uh, I'll tell you something very quickly. I live in Montreal, Canada, and somebody uncovered that there was a dog meat trade happening right here in Montreal. And it's, you know, upheld by, a, you know, a family, a Korean Chinese family. Um, and we were like, I'm an animal rights activist, and we were trying to find a way to link it to the sale point. And then we're like, well, we would need to be able to test, you know, if it's dog meat and prove that it's dog meat, because that's the only way you could make it, you know, like a legal issue, uh, because you're not allowed to sell on, you know, inspected meat, like meat that has not been inspected by, you know, like an official plant. Uh, that's supervised, but um, we were having the hardest time trying to find a kit to actually test the, the meat. So that's very impressive. I'm very impressed by you. 
Um, and so let's talk a little bit about this rehabilitation center that you set up in Capaz Tarlac. Tarlac is the province, Capaz is, or I'm not even sure if I'm pronouncing it right, that's the city. <laughs> Yeah, um, Capas is the municipality. Well, there there's um strong campaign for it to become a city soon. Okay. So it may become it's a, a county. city. The, okay. Yes, okay. In, in the near future. And Tarlac is the province where it is. And is it south, north? Like uh... it's it's um actually central. central. We call it central Luzon because remember oh. the Philippines is you know divided into three different yes. major islands. Yes. So we're in Luzon, the, the 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 upward island, and then we have also Visayas and then Mindanao, which is the south of the Philippines. And in Luzon, we're also divided into NCR or National Capital Region where Manila is, Central Luzon, and different regions also. So we are, the, the, the rescue center is in Central Luzon. Oh, wow. And so would you say it's, it's like what year what, did you manage to establish that, you know, rehabilitation rescue center? It was in, uh, I think in, in 2006 when we had um, okay. established the 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 rescue and rehabilitation center and the history there is actually when we were doing uh, the dog meat trade um, rescues and raids so we are able to rescue hundreds of dogs here and there and we would have partnership with different local government units that has pounds mm. and we would bring the dogs to them right. and we would tell them to keep the dogs and we would provide you know food and whatever medication and all right but since these are pounds we are always constantly being pressed to to say to by them and 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 with um you still have Time. dogs here yes yeah. you still have dogs here we're we're loaded we still have to we need to, yeah to, we need a space a we pound is like able... that you know like okay we've got 10 days otherwise the dog's gonna be put down or you know yeah yes. and it, it's so pressing because it, it's happening every now and then and then yes. we said i mean charles said we have to be able to get a rescue center i mean yes. dumping all these rescues to the pounds is not helping because no. eventually they're, they're just gonna be killed and we yeah. hate that you know for all the scenario. work that you went through and the trouble of rescuing them and then they end up euthanized yeah that would be terrible exactly. <laughs> so we said that's what we're doing is gonna be useless if this is what's gonna happen to these dogs at the end of the day so wow. in 2006 we had uh, established the rescue and rehabilitation center and it's in the central Luzon because um further is the north Luzon I mean that's where the consumption is and south Luzon is where the the source is so we're mm. in the middle oh, so, wow. you know, the so you're like the, the haven <laughs> in the middle yeah. um but uh yeah uh, speaking of the consumption would you say it's mostly consumed dog meat by older men or like what is the typical profile of a dog meat consumer would you say yeah i would think that they're being consumed more by men and middle age to older men mm -hmm. because you know i i'm I it's like don't that know in most countries yeah Yes, it, it's. I, I think it has also something to do with machismo or yes or virility. I mean, a lot yeah, of a, a lot of links between apparent dog meat and virility, and I think, I think it was in South Korea when there was, um, you know, the Olympics, uh, and you know, I forgot it was the Winter Olympics, and I think some of the athletes had eaten dog meat or some of them had eaten dog meat and they tested positive for you know uh, steroids or some but mm. anyways they found out that they had injected that into the dog so so that's why you know like yes it will help virility if you're injecting you know those kind of steroids in the dog you know of course but um yeah no so I mean that's goes back to kind of these mythical beliefs that are not founded in science clearly but right. you know that word to mouth it has you know come to become uh, 
part of their mindset and their belief system. But uh, so yeah. older we men, did, yeah, yeah, older men. And we believe also that there was even a belief that when you have the skin issues in your body, yes, and then you eat dog meat, you you'll be cured of 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 this. Mm. How do you problems. explain that? <laughs> and I said, what? Like, what's the <laughs> There's relationship? There's really no science to it. Oh, but... I think maybe it would be related to the same reason why some doctors in South Korea, I mean, hopefully not anymore, but I, I believe it still happens. They prescribe dog meat to patients recovering from surgery because they believe that the, that you will heal quicker. Because a dog, apparently, if it gets a cut, it heals very quickly compared to a human. But I'm like, if that's true, then we should eat cheetahs if we want to run faster. I mean, it's just <laughs> the logic is the five. <laughs> I mean, anyways, it's it's uh, all part of the problem. I mean, all these like false beliefs and uh, it all feeds into it. But um, so going back to your center, um. I imagine it's not just run by volunteers. I imagine you have permanent staff there and, you know, you need a veterinarian or do you work with the local vet hospital? How does it work? Like when a dog is rescued and they, they enter that facility, what the what are the stages that the, the dog goes through before they can be adopted? Oh, yeah. Um, the moment that we bring dogs to the center, they are immediately checked. Yes. And, you know, they, they stay, we have a quarantine area where they yes. are, they stay for a while for observation, treatment and all. And until the time that they get um, uh, spayed, neutered and has completed whatever medication or vaccination that they, they are going through before they're even um, brought inside our central kennel um, facility. And that's um, where they are actually being mingled with other dogs. Yeah. So there, um, they are also being mingled according to their disposition. I mean, an age, of course, the, the, the senior dogs, would, we would put them in a senior dog kennel. So that's, right. you know, we, we classify them based also on their temperament. We yes. don't want to be combining... Um, a little um, dog, young, annoying. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So that, that's, how, <laughs> that's how we we do it. And then uh, to make sure also that we don't have dog fights exactly. in, in, inside yes. the kennel. Yes. So that, that's how we, we do it. And then um, from time to time, um, the, the dogs are being checked based on, again, again on the, the initial findings. We have a clinic. Um, a very, you know, basic and small clinic in the center that really caters more on our rescues. We do have veterinarians and uh, veterinary technicians um, in the rescue center. And we also have um, um, vet student volunteers that helps us um, uh, in, in our day-to-day -day operations in looking after the health. Yeah of the well, dogs and of course the we the this these vets are are permanent employees of the organization. Oh wow but yeah but we welcome vet volunteers, vet students from yes. different universities because uh they, they do help a lot. Yeah. And they, they also get in turn they also get that training and education from our um in house veterinarians. And what would you say um are are these dogs once they're ready for adoption? Are you able to adopt them locally, or is that is that like how would you say like are most of the dogs uh, flown to the U.S. for example, or is it more local or Europe? You know what would you say <laughs> is the breakdown? Actually, Jade, yeah, actually, I I I, I get envious when when I see you know the massive dog adoptions being done to to US to Canada yeah. and all because here in the Philippines no we're not doing that oh, wow. or there may be some opportunities but not as um as common as yeah it's common. very expensive right to exactly. fly dogs yes yes 
and there's a lot of I'm sorry of requirements involved in in flying yes. these dogs also to the because the country of course is you know a, a really you know um labeled country yes. number five actually I think worldwide so not many countries also accept our dogs but we do have from time to time one or two here and there but our dog adoptions are really um, local adoptions. Well, that's actually a blessing because I'm sure you've heard about the CDC ban. I mean, the pandemic alone caused so much yeah. problems. Uh, you know, the flights, there were no volunteers to fly dogs and that cuts the cost a lot, like sometimes in half of the flight ticket. And so a lot of the organizations had to pay for cargo flights, which was like ridiculously expensive. Uh, so I would say that that was a blessing that you mostly are able to adopt them locally. Yeah. And would you say that um, how many dogs at any time are in your shelter? Like, is it hundreds or how many would you say? Yeah, we when we were starting, we used to be <clears throat> having thousands of dogs in the oh in wow the, okay in the center but then eventually you know as the years go by we started like really focusing on our adoption and we have reduced the population as well yeah right now we have over 200 now in yeah over i think 200 in the cent I, no sorry uh, the last i think is about uh, 250 something plus in the center and um what we do is that we 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 do um rehabilitation programs you know to 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 expedite the, yeah. their their ability to be able to 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 be rehomed. to find a home yeah to find yes a home. because you know it, it it's already difficult to find a home and then if you have this unadoptable dog or difficult dog to 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 offer yes. for adoption Yes. Then you have two problems. You're dealing with two problems already. Yes, exactly. So we're, we're actually, yeah, we're doing really a lot of this um, rehabilitation uh, program in, in the center. And we are really, you know, appealing to our volunteers to come and help us you know, rehabilitate these dogs. Because yes. the more human interactions that yes. they have, yes. it's really easier for them to warm Absolutely. up with 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 people and and to increase also our adoption rates we've been doing mall tours yes well i mean i know that you actually uh, on your website it was clear that you accept volunteer tourism like you have something that you invite people if they're going to be traveling to the philippines to actually be able to volunteer which is something i find extremely appealing um i hope to be able to visit your your facilities soon because that is something I actually, from doing the podcast, I was like, okay, so what's the next step for me? And I would love to be there and help, you know, hands on, you know, like see the dogs, you know, experience it for myself because we can talk about it and we can see the pictures on the internet, but it's, it doesn't compare to the experience of being there.
And so I think that's great. And um, would you say that the dogs in your, your center, for the most part, I mean, we talked about that. So especially stray dogs that have not had the familiar, the experience of being in a home before. And so they would need more socialization than, you know, dogs that were sold from their owners or, you know, dogs that were stolen. Um, But um, my other question was, is there a prevalent cat meat trade in the Philippines? That's something I'm curious about because in South Korea, I was told it's really not a thing. Uh, You know, there's random people, of course, doing it, but it's not a trade per se. Uh, What would you say in the Philippines? Does it happen? Uh, No. No way. Eh? Oh, also, yes, <laughs> yay. So it's yeah, a no. Yeah, at least <laughs> the cats are safe. No. Yes. The cats are very safe here in the Philippines. So not really. I mean, there we, we get some, you know, reports, but it's when we validate Random. it, it's, yeah. Yeah, it, it's baseless and it's not like massive or no. not even little. Or it, it's really very remote or Minimal. It's not even happening. Yeah, well, that's great news. <laughs> I have two cats myself, so I'm happy for them. <laughs> um, now, I guess I would, you know, okay, we talked about that. Would you say that, you know, the same that happens in Vietnam and in Indonesia in particular is that there's been a lot of vigilante justice taken by, you know, pet owners that have had their pets stolen. And so it's creating a lot of social unrest in Vietnam in particular. I mean, we see that happening on social media all the time. We see reports of, you know, people uh, confronting the dog meat trader, the one that stole their pet and, you know, enacting vigilante justice. Would you say that that kind of thing happens a lot in the Philippines as well or much less? Or? Well, it, it's happening much, much less. Yeah. And in fact, uh, very recently, actually, we had that um, vigilante, if, 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 if that's how you call it, when he, this, this um, um, individual confronted yes. an, an, a, a man that she said is going to slaughter the the dog for for mm. human consumption for their consumption and you know we assisted the person legally gave advice and all but in terms of it really happening uh, or very popular it's not and no. you know in the philippines it's still the concept of you're the animal welfare organization you do it so it's just oh, like oh yeah hey, they delegate to you yeah, yeah. hey <laughs> Hey, they it's, might call um, you. Like, can you take yeah. care of this for me? Please? Yeah, there's these two guys walking with a dog. Yeah, they're 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 they're. Go- they, I think I think they're going to kill it for for food, and they're just walking their dog. So I oh, said, okay, wow. any other details, please? So you you're the you're the organization yeah, that does it. Then you, if you do just it. Walking their dog. <laughs> <laughs> then you yeah. do it. You investigate. So. I think we're still on that stage. Okay. But, you know, people really acting. and that, Because that's what we want to happen. We always say that animal welfare, animal protection is yes. everybody's responsibility. Of it's course. not just us as an organization, but it's everybody's responsibility. It cannot be just you. It has to be the community that comes together. Correct. Yes, for the and greater that's why good. We said that. Yeah, we, we, we help you, we capacitate you, we assist yeah. you. I'm, I'm on call 24 hours a day even right. just to give you advice on how to do it. But you have to do it. I cannot send my people here in Luzon to go to Mindanao to do yeah. that for you. No, no, that's right. You can't assume either. You know, there's a lot of, you know, prejudice, you know, in that, you know. So you don't want to assume the worst. <laughs> um, And so I guess... Part of, you know, part of my question, and I think we touched upon it a little bit, but, you know, seeing that you're from the Philippines, like growing up, did did you witness anything related to dog meat or was it much later on as an adult that you got to hear from it, about it? Well, no, actually, as a young, uh, as a young girl, I was able to not witness this because I, I refused to see it, but I knew people who were really, um, really killing dogs for food in, mm. in our community. 
even in the family, I mean, extended family, I've, I've, I've heard that there, okay. you know, there's you were aware of this. You were aware. I was of really that. aware okay. of it, but I wasn't aware aware of it in the sense that, you know, it it's so huge that it has to stop. I was aware of it, and I feel so bad. And then just that in my little mind at that time, I was hurt. But you know, it it it, it stays on there. Maybe yeah. that's why I'm doing this job right now because that that small seed of pain that yeah. was there yeah. started to grow as I was, you know, learning more. Up. Yeah, yeah, and having more capability and having more um um learning and education how to do it. So wow. maybe. So th- th- that's why I, I did I, I was as I was telling you I didn't even want to do this no you know I, I just want to be a lawyer <laughs> <laughs> like I want my life simple and you know in, in fact I always say my life would be so much simpler if I didn't know all of this you know ignorance is bliss as they say uh, yeah yes, you're right. but, but at the same time I don't regret because I wouldn't exchange you know like if if there's anything I can do to help I have to do it. You know, like, I feel like my life, what's the purpose of our lives if it's not to try to, you know, leave this world a better place than how we found it. And so I feel like it's our duty, each of us have a duty to try to enact good and enact justice for the for those of us that don't have a voice or that don't have a voice that is heard. (laughs) In the case of animals, because I, you know, there's a, a saying that, you know, we're voice for the voiceless. I do feel they have a voice. It's just that we don't listen, you know, as a society. Yeah. Um, and we would, you know, do better to listen. <laughs> That's um, correct. And would you say in the Philippines, there's an overriding religion? Like, is it like, I'm not familiar with the Philippines. Like, is it Buddhist or not at all? Like, yes, very Buddhist. We're, we're, no, no, we're, we're very, um, um, majority of the Filipinos are Catholic. Roman oh. Catholic. Oh, because yeah. you were colonized by Spain, right? Nice. So, yeah, the Catholic. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that, that would have its way of making it uh, in that part of the world. And to this day, are they, or is it like the overriding religion is, you know, yes. Catholicism yes. or Christianity? Yes, okay. Yes. yes. And so, um, my other question has always been because when I found out about this trade, what the reason why I got involved is because I'm a vegan. So for me, whether it's a dog or, you know, like I do feel a particular attachment to dogs because they have a special place in, in our lives. Um, You know, obviously they go to war with us, you know, they are, you know, like healing, you know, patients or therapy animals, Um, So I do feel a particular love for dogs. But you know, that being said, for me, killing an animal that doesn't want to die is a problem in itself. And the reason why I got so invested in this cause is because I saw some images of, you know, like the videos of, you know, dogs being dismembered, boiled, burnt alive. And that I was like, what is happening i couldn't explain it and i said i was looking for information and you know how it is on the internet it's a lot of misinformation somebody says something somebody contradicts it and so that's really why i started the podcast i wanted to learn from people that were living in those countries that would have the insight to share with us and so is it the case that there's a belief that if you torture the dog before death that the more you know medicinal the meat will be the better the meat will be whether it's taste or you know those mythical beliefs like is it the case that you know they torture they make a point of making the dog suffer before slaughter yeah actually yes in the sense that the way the dogs are being killed for for rituals is that you know the the usual they're being whipped on their i mean um hit on their head so they get unconscious and um and you know of course the the dog won't die immediately or instantaneously so he there's that degree of pain and suffering on the part of the animal and 
when we were doing consultations and research with the elders and, and people in that province, they would say that, you know, that that's part of the ritual. You have to do it because it, it, it seems since like, like what I mentioned to you about uh, the dogs being offered as a sacrifice for, for, um, uh, for uh, this really ritual. Um, because it, it's their way of cleansing. And, okay, um, but is that part of a religion of some sort? Yeah, it's Well, it's been, you, you know, in the Philippines, you may be Catholic, but there's still some influence of culture and tradition from whatever possibly tribe, tribe that okay. you, you, you came from. Oh, that they because, make animal <laughs> sacrifices, you know, that, yes, that's part so, of their ritual. Okay. Yeah. Yes. So in, in the Philippines, that's where really, you know, the 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 the, the slaughtering, the killing of dogs mm. um really happens as a part of their tradition. So yes, that in a way is um linked maybe to their tradition that if you inflict pain to this animal, then it it helps in the cleansing also of the people. Oh, wow. That you know, that that's <laughs> witnessing or being yes. offered to or even the spirit of the departed hmm. you know it will because the dogs are being used as as a um as a an animal for sacrifice for tragic you know hmm. tragic um occurrences in the family or in the tribe ah, because they see okay. they see that the dogs are guardians they see that the dogs being a companion, they would guard um, mm. the departed or even the people left behind. That yeah. they will, it will cleanse their mind of the 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 reason of the death, especially mm. those that have prepared you know, or helped prepare the 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 dead in in mm. in. You know, or handle the dead. So it, it's really that cleansing spirit. Oh, wow. So they're, also, they're they're killing the dog so that the dog could guard their departed. Departed oh. and also the living. So it, it has uh, that relation to that. Yeah. So and and does that belief translate to other animals or like is it really specific to dogs in your opinion? Well, for for dogs, as I mentioned, the dogs are used for for rituals that involves death in the family. Not so person. much, you know, cows yeah. or lambs. Yes. No. Okay. For celebratory, for celebratory, <laughs> they are right. also celebratory um, animal sacrifices. So they use chickens, most mostly chicken. Oh, um, okay. And, and pigs and okay. pigs and cows. Okay. So they are being used for the different The cleansing purpose. happens with the dogs and the celebration happens with other animals. Okay. I mean, listen, I, I, and that's more like, you know, the tribe, like you said, you know, more like yeah. related to that. Okay. Um, And I guess, you know, I'm a little bit curious because I really learned about Animal Kingdom Foundation when I saw the campaign that she did in partnership with Soy Dog Foundation. Yes. And I will put the links up because the campaign is still very much active. And uh, so it's a global petition to the, you know, I invite everyone to sign. I'll put the link in the description box. Um, and basically it's to help shut down the dog meat trade in the Philippines. And the petition is addressed to the Bureau of Animal Industry of the Department of Agriculture and the local government units of the Philippines. And I'll just read the excerpt from the petition. It'll give our viewers a better idea of, you know, the goal of this petition. So we are writing to request the Bureau of Animal Industry of the Department of Agriculture and local government units actively enforce the existing laws regarding the brutal torture and slaughter of dogs under the Animal Welfare Act of 1998, the Anti-Rabies Act of 2007, and the National Meat Inspection Service Act number 10536. Uh, so I am, you know, obviously everyone signed at home. <laughs> I signed it. I actually signed it three times because, uh, you know, we're using different email signatures, but um addresses i mean um how does this partnership with soy dog foundation come about 
well um it's um it started actually with our founders charles mm-hmm. is a british guy yeah and and jill and john are also from the uk oh. they actually charles was also actually a friend of jill and then oh. they 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 work together in in the uk for for animals or or, or other issues relating to animals in the past wow. and so when jill and john started soy dogs in 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 thailand charles yeah. was also mo- uh, at the same time doing um of course and establishing he started it before founders. them because i think so a dog was 2003-2004 that they really established and so charles had already started in 2002 with animal kingdom yes. okay yeah so so more or less it's like that but quite frankly they have not really connected while while both of them were in asia at the time mm. both were so engaged and so busy doing their thing i right. mean I, I know that soy dog has a lot of you know um issues all re- also with 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 street dogs in 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 Phuket and and Charles was also so you know um focused on on the elimination of the dog with trade so yeah. in the country so yeah. and you know we that time we I said you know you know it, it's their story and ours it seems like we're connected ever of since course. we're connected and and um so recently um there's this opportunity for us to be working together soy dog said that hey we are working also to de- to end the dog meat trade in asia and you're doing um a very good job in the philippines so they said where are you now and how can we help and collaborate oh, so wow. it's a mutual you know um agreement and understanding that we will collaborate in ending the dog meat trade here in the philippines we've shared our um struggles <laughs> and also our uh, successes and uh, actually quite frankly um if you've seen the petition we said to 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 enforce it right yes. because uh, as as we we were talking about a while ago you know we may have the law but is it really actually being enforced and exactly. implemented exactly which is another you know conversation to to, to be of talking of course about. <laughs> So, so in in that sense, we said, uh, let okay, let let's let's bond together, let's let's help end this, and then let's also take the the successes of Animal Kingdom Foundation and share it with the other Asian countries that has dog meat trade, yes, and and you know and highlight, and then we learn from it, and then we share exactly from, from them how we are doing it. So you know, with with all these things being discussed, and I said, you know. Uh, the dog meat trade is really just not a Philippine issue; it's an um, uh, an Asian issue. So yeah, I'm I'm happy to 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 be working together with Soy Dog. So that's how we oh, were able wow. to be. You know, yeah, because um, you're establishing a model that others can follow. I mean, that's so important because you draw inspiration and actually, you know, concrete action that you can take and you know, uh, copy in other countries. Um, I'm just curious, when did Charles pass away? Because the founder of uh, Animal Kingdom, he's no longer with us. Yes, he passed away December of 2017 in, in, oh, a, okay. you know, in an accident at home. And yeah. it, it was sad because although he was becoming very sickly at that time, um, he was always very eager to come back here and work and when he's here in the philippines he meets with people he does his work he he even does carpentry in the rescue center and oh, he's wow. very active he's very then, passionate course, yeah he was very yeah, but passionate. then you know he, he's not getting any younger and we have been telling them him actually to to you know minimize his trip already because he's also taking a toll on his health and all but I think when you, when you love what you do and you have the passion, yeah, and really that it doesn't feel like work. Yeah, it doesn't feel like work when yeah. you're you're that impassioned by it. So, um, and I always ask my guests a very similar question, and I'm curious what you're gonna say. I have a feeling that you're a bit positive on it, but um, do you believe? that we will ever see the end of this dog cat me trade i mean not just in the philippines but as a whole yes yes wow. 
Yes. Yes, I believe that. I believe that. When we were starting the dog meat trade campaign in the Philippines, we, we were rescuing hundreds hmm. of dogs in, in vans, in jeepneys, in wow. pickups. But the amount of dogs that we are rescuing now is not nothing incomparable to those wow. that we were rescuing before. And the number of you know traders, they're not as organized as before. Yes. So with, with this with this observation and you know fact that that we see and they said eventually that will come that will end and of course there's this growing awareness on animal welfare of compassion yes. of environmental protection of wildlife protection mm-hmm. you know the, the the children right now the young population right now they're so conscious about the pe- the, the food that they eat Yes. The, the 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 animals in their environment yeah. the environment itself so i i guess it's gonna happen yeah it's gonna happen it's a question of time right <laughs> yes it's a question of time it may not be during our lifetime no but you know what i always i always say is that we started this and somebody in the future well, will learn it. from us yeah. and then st- continue doing this and then somebody again will end it well, I agree with you because I do believe it's very much a generational issue. I think the younger generation in all parts of the world are becoming a little bit, a lot more aware. And whether it's more of the environment that they are touched by and the implication that animal agriculture has on the environment, I believe more and more people are becoming aware. And, you know, obviously there's globalization, like I said, you know, people are watching movies that are made from people from all parts of the world. Uh, You know, dogs in particular are always depicted as man's best friend. I do believe we will see the end. And I always say to my guests, because, you know, my guests are varied, you know, some are vegan, some are not. I always say, I know that this is something we can win. Because in my lifetime, I don't, I know for sure we will never see a vegan world. I'm not even sure we'll see a vegan world ever, but I do believe this dog cat meat trade will cease to exist. And so this is why I'm so impassioned and I'm so determined to keep fighting because, and fighting with intelligence, fighting with good strategies, fighting by donating and supporting organizations like yours that are doing the right thing. Um, supporting the local organizations in those countries to be able to have, you know, the 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 clout to enact, you know, what you, what you're the work that you're doing, and so uh, something else that uh, I always want to tell my guests is, and I would like to hear it from you, is how can we as foreigners, especially, come, and a lot of the viewers are from the United States, from the UK, from Canada, where I'm from. And how can we best help this cause overseas, like thousands of miles across the ocean from here? Um, I I will say it for you because, you know, I, I find that, you know, a lot of organizations are too humble, but I say donations. I mean, donations are key because we can't do the work. We're not in those countries. And if you believe, obviously do your due diligence you know, make sure that you're giving to organization you believe are actually doing right. legitimate good work. But donations are must, a must. Um, and the other ways, I mean, there are many ways and you list them on your website. You can adopt, obviously, a survivor and that dog becomes an advocate for the cause and raises awareness with your community. Um Obviously, uh, you can sponsor dogs. You have on your website a link uh, where you can sponsor. You can volunteer, as I mentioned before. So if definitely if you're planning to, you know, visit the Philippines, definitely, uh, you know, look at Animal Kingdom Foundation and apply to be a volunteer. And um, what else would you say? Like At this point, I think we've covered most of the, the ways that we can help, but. Yeah, I think yeah, I, I think we really uh we were able to cover really um substantially everything. And yes, you're correct. Donations in cash, in kind really helps us a lot because yeah. we are already so focused and busy in helping the animals. Yeah. And sometimes we forget 
that hey we need some resources you know to to help us continue yeah. this work and, and is we, not cheap <laughs> it's yes not cheap. and you know, and you know um, um while we we were also working on volunteers um it's important that you know permanent uh, staff mm-hmm. are there really focused yes. to do uh, yeah. most of the jobs because it has i mean the work we do it has to be consistent, consistent. absolutely you know? A volunteer you cannot can't miss out on, on, yeah exactly yeah you cannot miss out on a no. even single detail of it so it and, has me and something else i always add is that if you're going to donate it's always great if you can donate monthly instead mm-hmm. of you know like once upon a time like here and there because you know instead of giving a hundred dollars if that's you know you can't spare more than that just like make it ten dollars a month you know something yes. that you can rely a- upon and you can you know build you know campaigns Forward around <laughs> um because it's costly you know it's costly what you do and uh to that point i i i believe the link is part of the petition but if it's not i will add it i uh, recently donated twice for uh you can pay for a billboard and our money, our U.S. or Canadian dollars goes very far. So, I mean, I really, really encourage it because the billboards speak for themselves and it raises awareness and it tells the country, well, listen, we are aware of this issue and we're working together to end it. So I think that's beautiful. So thank you so much, Heidi. I really appreciate thank your you time so today. It's been amazing learning from you. And you know, I could keep talking to you forever. But <laughs> you know, in the interest of time, and you do have a, a lot of work on your plate. So we'll let you go. But uh, thank you so much. And I invite our viewers to obviously go look at the website, look at their social media pages, support, follow what they do, share and donate, of course. <laughs> Thank you, thank you so much, Jane, for this opportunity. And thank you so much to, to your viewers. You're all amazing people. So please help us here in the Philippines. Help Animal Kingdom Foundation and the dog meat trade. Absolutely. Amen to that. <laughs> Have a wonderful day. Take care. And I'll let you know when this will uh, be released. Great. Awesome. Okay. Thank you so much, Jane. Thank you so much. Thank you, Heidi. Take care. Right. Bye.